Great, thank you so much, Dr. Olivier, and also Dr. Ewer for suggesting this title. And I think that um, I've had a very nice uh, background by Dr. Souter, who has been involved in one of the guidelines. And also this morning, we had a great session in cardiotoxicity. And I'd have to thank Dr. Liffens from the Netherlands, who really described what guidelines are very carefully. And the Institute of Medicine did describe guidelines as needing to be practical, but also evidence-based. So a lot of what I'm talking about is not totally evidence-based, and as he mentioned, which I thought was great, we can't really have randomized studies for everything we do, and his example was if you're um, in jumping out of a plane in a parachute, you're not gonna do a randomized study to decide if you're gonna die or not if you don't open your parachute. So I thought that that was pretty remarkable, and that's a lot of what we do in oncology. We know some of the things that will cause harm, so a lot of what we do is very consensus-based. And these are my disclosures. And I, am, I use the title guidelines here somewhat loosely because what I'm gonna talk about in these several different papers are heavily consensus-based. And really, the, the only guidelines here that are true evidence-based are those from ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. The others are exceptionally well-referenced and have a great amount of data, but don't really all put level, levels of evidence in there. Now, the American Heart Association did um, have a what they called a statement paper that just came out in the last year. And I'd really recommend, if you're interested in this topic, that you take these references or look at the slides and read these papers. They're really excellent, excellent summaries of the data that's out there and the evidence that's out there. And they had this nice algorithm that they put forth. Um, and the, the top and the blue is the kind of diagnostic testing and when it should be done or, or when we're looking at it being done. And then in the red is really the disease, the cancer treatment itself. And in the green is how we can prevent it and treat with um, either cardiac drugs or other things to prevent cardiac toxicity. Now, before we start, just to outly or to lay out some of the diagnostic tools that are available, and I am not a cardiologist, as you know, an oncologist, so I hesitate somewhat to talk about these things with two really formidable cardiologists in the front row, but I think that most of us would say that in routine practice, we mostly use echocardiography for our um, evaluation of our patients. And other tests that are done are, are MUGA scans, which are the nuclear cardiac imaging scans, and they're probably used quite a bit also in the U.S. Um, the problem with them are that you do get cumulative radiation exposure, and you really can't look at the other structures of the heart, which are very important. You have cardiac MRI, which we clearly don't do on a routine basis because of the expense and, and other issues. And then you have cardiac biomarkers, which have not proven really to give us evidence that they're going to be um, effective, at least at this time. Now, the, um, Tom Souter already mentioned this as a, an author of this. This is an outstanding position paper. It has a huge amount of information. And as has already been mentioned, cardiotoxicity is not just about the anthracyclines. And I think we all know that as oncologists, that many of the drugs that we use really and, and radiation can be associated with cardiac toxicity. And, and the, the beauty of this paper is really it, it doesn't leave any um, area untouched. Every part of oncology drugs that we have out there are really discussed in this um, position paper. They first discussed myocardial dysfunction with heart failure and, and recommend that an ejection fraction be determined before and af after treatment. Um, and they describe lower limit of normal as 50%, which is interesting because th that's somewhat, um, for us who are in clinical trials, we have arguments with our cardiologists. They'll say, well, we can't say it's just 50. It's 50 to 55. But, um, in this paper, they do describe the lower limit of 
and if, it, if there's a drop of more than 10 percent and um, below, that should be below the lower limit of normal, a repeat assessment. So if, or that, that's actually right, above normal, a repeat assessment. But if they're asymptomatic, if it's below lower limit of normal, it is recommended to treat with ACE inhibitors or ARBs or beta blockers. And then in symptomatic patients, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are recommended. So for coronary artery disease, you've already seen pretty much this uh, already. You can have vasospasm associated with the pyrimidine analogs. Um, it's recommended that you get regular EKGs. And only rechallenge if you really need to use the drug in those patients. If there's no alternative, you can pretreat with nitrates and or calcium channel blockers. And then you obviously have long-term follow-up, and you can test for the presence of coronary artery disease if you feel that that's important. Now, the, there, this list just shows the many um, pathophysiological pathophysi mechanisms of coronary artery disease and cancer treatment. I'm not going to go through this because you've already heard a really nice presentation on that. Um, this, is the next one is really arrhythmias. And we're seeing more and more of this, and especially for drug approval, the FDA is requiring that many of our newer drugs have a look at the QT interval and make sure there's not a lengthening of it because many of the newer drugs do, do that. So it's recommended for all of our oncology patients that we get an EKG and a QT interval at baseline. Um, and, and one example I'll give you, which is a new one, the CDK4-6 inhibitors have just been approved in the last um, couple of years, and one of them, ribocyclib, is associated with a long QT, and a patient did have a sudden death. So I think it's very important, and, and a lot of us um, probably don't think about it when we have our breast cancer patients who are feeling well and we put them on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. We don't necessarily do a, an EKG, but I think it's very important to do that. And then patients with a history of a, a QT prolongation, cardiac disease, or other drugs that, that prolong the QT, bradycardia, thyroid disease, or electrolyte abnormality should have repeated Q EKGs. And you should discontinue if the QTC is more than 50 or prolong if it's greater than 60. You obviously should avoid hypokalemia and extreme bradycardia and then limit exposure to, to these other drugs. So what are the cancer drugs that are associated with cardiac arrhythmias? Well, there's a huge number, as you can see here, and you may not have even think about it as you're treating patients. But really, most of, most of the drugs that we give will have some kind of cardiac effect. So it's probably if you do have a cardiac event in a patient, besides thinking that it might be their patient's own physiology, it it's probably can be attributed to the cardiac disease. And what are the risk factors for QT prolongation? I already mentioned the electrolyte imbalance. Um, you can have hypothyroidism or other drugs, and many, many drugs will cause a prolonged QT, and I think that's why our FDA is so interested in this. Number one, the drugs themselves will do it, but interaction with other drugs will also do it. So I won't go through it all, but as I mentioned, this is a great um, article really to look up all of these different effects. Now, hypertension, too, has been mentioned, and this is something, especially when, certainly when we were using bevacizumab in breast cancer, I became very, very aware of that. It's extremely common. Um, and not being a cardiologist or even being close to internal medicine for many years was really, um, had to relearn how to treat hypertension. And many of the drugs that we give, uh, and I'll show it on the next slide, really today are associated with this. It's very important to treat it very early and aggressively um, with all the different agents mentioned there. Um, it, it's preferred to use didro dihydropyrimidine calcium channel blockers because the non-dihydropyridine, like verapamil, for example, um, those have more drug interactions with statins, for example. So it's important to really look at the um, type of drugs that you're using. 
And you should really reduce the agent that you're using or discontinue it. For example, if you're using VEGF inhibitors, if you can't control the blood pressure, and that sometimes can be the case. And if you just look at the, the meta-analysis showing the incidence of hypertension um, with major VEGF inhibitor treatment, it's shown here, and it's really high. You can see up to almost 50% regorafenib. So it's clearly a significant issue, and it, it has to be um, treated. It can't be ignored just because the patient has cancer. It's really, really important. So there are other conditions and other kinds of patients that, that, these, um, that this statement paper talked about, those with valvular disease, and shown there the patients who are elderly, the patients who are pregnant. So again, as I mentioned, this really is a very nice a review in all, with all the literature that's available in all these different areas. Now, the clinical factors associated with increased venous thromboembolism are um, some of them very clear. For example, they, it can be associated just with having a specific kind of cancer or having an advanced cancer. It can be related to comorbidities in a patient. It can be related to trauma uh, or major surgery, for example, or hospitalization. So those are also um, very high on our list of in the differential diagnosis when a patient has some kind of event that they could have a thromboembolism. So um, what, in the summary of this paper, which is very hard to summarize because it was so extensive and complete, but the treatment options to prevent or recover from myocardial dysfunction would be to obviously identify and treat the risk factors and the comorbidities, that's obvious. And for QT prolongation, to avoid the QT prolonging drugs, and, and we really have to get better at knowing what these drugs do to patients and paying attention to that because there's a lot of polypharmacy in our patients, especially older patients. They're on lots of different drugs, and we need to manage the electrolytes. And for anthracyclines in particular, we've learned through the years, and it took us a long time, to limit the cumulative dose, and it's usually below 240 per meter squared. We can use liposomal delivery, and we can use dexrazoxane, which I think is a great cardioprotectant, but has um, had some issues. And then the treatment um, treatments on the right would be for the hypertension, for hypercholesterolemia, and aerobic exercise is very important. I'm going to talk more in some of the other um, guidelines about what to do with trastuzumab, for example. So if you look at exercise in particular, there is a lot or there are a lot of data that are coming out showing that exercise does benefit, certainly before a patient has a cancer diagnosis, if they're more fit, they're more likely to do well with the treatment, and also after treatment. So you can improve your cardiovascular function, which is always a good thing. You can improve your immune function, which is excellent too. Um, patients are more likely to complete their chemotherapy, have better muscle strength, and better mood and self-esteem overall. So I think that exercise can't be emphasized enough for these patients, and especially, and I treat breast cancer, a lot of the patients tend to gain weight on their treatments. They're taking steroids, they may have nausea, they may not you know, be eating their normal um, diet, but I think to really encourage exercise is incredibly important. So the, this, um, this guideline recommended in the future that we really need to refine the predisposing factors for the development of um, cardiovascular dysfunction related to cancer treatment, um, to evaluate subclinical LV dysfunction. I think that's very important. We all know that the ejection fraction is a late finding, um, and actually it's probably too late once that's dropped quite a bit. And then what is, how is it, does it transition to overt heart failure? We need to define the most reliable cardiac monitoring approach, which much work is being done on that now, and then determine the clinical effect and outcome 
after cancer therapy. And an overarching theme of all of this is we really do need long follow-up. And that's been a problem we have in the adult population. The pediatric um, oncologists have done a better job in really having 20 year, et cetera, follow-up for their patients, whereas an adult, we have really not done that. So we're using these very um, toxic therapies in mid to middle age, some young age, and we, we don't have that 20 to 30 year follow-up, so we really need to do that. Now the next guidelines are the ASCO um, practice guidelines, and these are evidence-based guidelines. So they did go through and they graded all of the guidelines with levels of evidence. And this one is the prevention and monitoring of cardiac dysfunction in survivors of adult cancers. And, I, and they really are extremely well vetted as far as evidence. They have an overarching clinical questions that they addressed in this guideline um, that I'm gonna go through them all. The first one is, which cancer patients are at increased risk for developing cardiac dysfunction? As I mentioned before, it's important that we know which, who those patients are. Second, which preventative strategies minimize risk before you start therapy? So can we start something at the same time that we start our cancer therapy? Which strat strategies minimize risk during potential cardiac toxic therapy? That's recommendation three. What are the surveillance method during treatment? in patients at risk, and that would be any patient um, on an anthracycline, for example. And then what are the preferred surveillance or monitoring after the treatment, so in long-term follow-up? That's recommendation five. So th the first one is these are the patients that they consider at high risk of cardiac dysfunction. High-dose anthracyclines, which would be 250 per meter squared or more of an anthracyte of doxorubicin or 600 milligram per meter squared of epirubicin. High dose radiation um, within the heart field or with the heart in the field. Lower anthracycline dose with radiation um, it, with heart in the field. And then lower dose anthracyclines or trastuzumab alone with multiple risk factors. Um, and those would be things like diabetes, other cardiac disease. They consider that anyone who is getting a lower dose anthracycline or trastuzumab alone over 60 to be at high risk. So that's a really, that's a lot of patients right there. And then if the patient has the ejection fraction of 50 to 55% and has a history of an MI or moderate valvular disease. Now those patients who get lower dose anthracyclines and then receive trastuzumab are also on this list. And they gave no recommendations for trastuzumab alone, low dose anthracycline or ra low dose radiation or kinase inhibitors. And just to note that the ASCO guidelines only use evidence. So they will not make a recommendation or even suggestion if there is not evidence there even though um, you know, we do have some evidence they didn't feel like it was strong enough to make a recommendation. So number two and three are preventative strategies prior to and during treatment, and I combined these because they were basically the same. Avoid cardiotoxicities if, or, or cardiotoxic therapies if others exist. Do um, the obvious things, a history and physical, screen and actively manage cardiac risk factors, do a, an echocardiogram at, at baseline. And they did um, say that dextroxane, dextroxane, liposomal doxorubicin, and continuous infusion are all um, preventative strategies during treatment. And then for if you do need to do mediastinal radiation, deep inspiration breath holding, or IMRT, have both been shown to decrease the heart in the field, though you still may, you have to do your planning to see which one may be better for the patient. And then finally, for the surveillance prior to and during treatment, 
Um, again, you do your history and physical, you evaluate, you manage, manage your cardiac risk factors. If the, there is an increased cardiac risk, an echo, um, which is, this is a really hard one, and I know I am very associated with ASCO, but I think these kind of statements are hard for us as practitioners to figure out what to do with it. It says, if increased cardiac risk, echo with frequency to be determined by the provider, so that really leaves it to us. Um, to decide how often. Trastuzumab indefinitely, if you have one of these patients who's doing great on trastuzumab and they're on it for years, the frequency of monitoring is to be determined by the provider because there's really, there's no evidence at all on that. Um, they do recommend to get an echo six to 12 months after completion of treatment if someone has had a cardiotoxic type therapy. And if there are signs or symptoms of cardiac dysfunction, um, you, you can read the list here. They recommend, uh, obviously, referral to a cardiologist, but they don't make any recommendations for continuing cancer treatment. And I think that's the dilemma we frequently find ourselves in with these patients who are doing well and then they have some cardiac dysfunction is what do we do at that point? So I, I wanted to show a couple of um, slides that really aren't in the guidelines, but I thought this was really important data that was just published by Don Hirschman from the SWAG group. And they showed the cumulative incidence of cardiac events by baseline risk factors. And you can see how much it increases if, you know, it, with all of these things, with diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, um, it, it was significant increase in cardiac events. And they did an analysis where they found that these five different risk factors and they added them together. If you had zero or one, um, what your risk of cardiac events was, it was about, I guess, a little over 10%. If you had two, it's in the 20 some percent. If you had three, it's almost 50% that a patient will have a cardiac um, event. So I think this is important to look at these five things for sure in your patients at baseline and really tailor their treatment and try not to use cardiotoxic drugs in those patients. So the next one that I wanted to discuss was a consensus from the American Society of Echocardiography and the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. And this was a tough paper for me to read as a non-cardiologist, so I have to say it's very, very um, much in, in the weeds for sure about echocardiography, which it should be. And they made the recommendation that they would prefer as a, an imaging technique a 3D echo. And they divided the um, different recommendations by what they considered the type of toxicity, the type one Cardiovascular toxicity was um, with the use of anthracyclines, which Dr. Ewer has put this in place. Type one is basically irreversible because you get irreversible damage with the anthracyclines. And they recommended a baseline EF, and if it was greater than 53%, and I don't know how they chose 53, maybe because it's between 50 and 55, but it's different than the other guidelines. So they recommended repeating it at completion of therapy and then six months. And if it's less than 53%, get a cardiology consult. In other words, if it's abnormal, and I would say that for any of these different guidelines that we work very closely with our cardiologists now if a patient has an abnormal result. Now, if the patient has a type two um, toxicity, which would be the type with trastuzumab that was felt to be largely reversible, um, if the ejection fraction is greater than 53% to get the um, echocardiogram every three months during treatment. And this is, this is pretty arbitrary um, recommendation. And it's really based on what we did with our initial trastuzumab studies. Um, and I was very involved with the FDA when we designed NSABP B31. And it was really, it's an arbitrary number. So, if you have type and two, one and two agents combined, it's recommended if the ejection fraction is normal to get it every three months during treatment and then six months later. And just to show you more um, in, a, in a schema to their expert consensus, what they recommended is if 
the regimen initially has a, something that's associated with type 1 toxicity. You get your baseline evaluation. If the LVEF is, ab is normal, um, you would follow up at completion and therapy in six months later. If it's not, you get your, basically your cardiology consult. And they also are very heavily into getting global longitudinal strain. There's a lot of new data coming out with that. Um, and, they, and the group is working very much on that. Now with trastuzumab, it was the same if it's abnormal with cardiology consult, then otherwise follow up every three months, and then the two together follow up every three months, and then six months later. And this just is a, more, a different schema, somewhat easier to read. What they recommend is baseline echoes, and this is really pretty um, significant during therapy. If a patient has more than 240 milligram per meter squared of anthracycline, that's doxorubicin, and the equivalent of epi, they recommend getting an echo prior to every additional dose of um, anthracycline, or 50 milligram per meter squared. That's pretty intense. I'm not sure how many people do that, but this, that's a pretty significant um, recommendation there. And then during therapy, they recommend every three months for Herceptin or, or um, HER2 targeted therapies, being the monoclonal antibodies, not the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And then post-therapy, this is where we get into a big problem because we don't have data for this. They do recommend, for example, with these trastuzumab patients to get one after, if it's adjuvant therapy six months later. Um, and if it's just metastatic disease, no routine testing if asymptomatic. And I think that's very reasonable. Um, it, it is not based on any evidence, and we have to use our clinical judgment for that. Now, I wanted to mention global longitudinal strain because it's really um, becoming more and more evident, to me at least, that the cardiologists feel like this is a much better measure of potential cardiotoxicity in our patients. And the strength of it, it at least in what the data is out there now, it's superior to predict all-cause mortality versus the ejection fraction. There's improved risk stratification for heart failure. It does recognize early LV dysfunction, and it is reproducible by trained operators. Um, but the limitations, it really depends on the quality of the, the image, images. It does depend on the training of, of the people doing it, as with ECHOs. It's influenced by loading, and there's no long-term randomized trials to predict symptomatic heart failure or a persistent decrease in LVF, what that means. Um, so that, that is a problem. However, I think the Australians, which I love this study, this just came out, it was just published, I think, last week or the week before, are doing a study called the SUCOR study, the strain surveillance of chemotherapy for improving cardiovascular outcomes and it's not a completed trial, but they did publish the first about 100 patients that have been randomized. And the patients are randomized. They have to be on a potentially cardiotoxic drug, and most of them are on anthracyclines. They're randomized to have either strain guidance or an echo ejection fraction guidance. Um, and, and not to go through the whole thing, but they're, those patients who do have reduced um, ejection fraction or reduced strain are treated with cardioprotective drugs on either arm. So it'll, the primary endpoint when this is all done in the 320 patients will be change in 3D ejection fraction. So I think this is really important to be doing these kind of studies and it'll give us some guidance hopefully on, on how to treat these patients in, that we've really, really desperately needed. The, the other thing I wanted to mention was that the, um, the package inserts for trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and when we try to figure out how we follow these patients, because I think this is where the biggest question comes for us in how often do we do imaging in these patients. We're pretty clear with the anthracyclines and, and some of the other drugs what to do. We're not so clear in this situation. Um, and the package insert really just says get an ejection fraction prior to therapy every three months during and at completion. 
and then they recommend stopping it if there is an ejection fraction drop of 16% or more and below lower limit of more and greater than 10% drop in ejection fraction. That's because that's exactly what was in the randomized studies that we did. And resume it, resume the treatments if the ejection fraction is normal. And then they recommend an ejection fraction every six months for two years after completion, and that was based on absolutely no evidence at all. Um, but it, I think it's what was done in the study, so it was put in there. And then for pertuzumab and trastuzumab to get a, an ejection fraction every 12 weeks for metastatic and adjuvant. So that that's really leaves us kind of in the dark of what to do. We have a lot of patients on pertuzumab and trastuzumab, and everyone asks, do we really need to do these echoes every three months? And my um, take on it is if a patient's doing well and they're two years out on pertuzumab and trastuzumab, I don't get an ejection fraction every three months. I really probably get maybe six months and then once a year, and then if the patient's doing well, they probably don't need them at all. The NCCN also has some minor wording in their guidelines, and this is just from the latest one for the treatment with trastuzumab or pertuzumab. And they, again, like everyone else, say to evaluate the ejection fraction. But they're honest about it. The op optimal frequency is not known. The, they quote the FDA label recommending it prior to initiation and every three months. So again, it's really... Um, Basically, it is up to us what to do, so I think we can back off. I personally feel strongly we can back off on doing these if a patient's doing very well far out from their treatment. So just to close with a, a couple of thoughts about can we prevent cardiac toxicity and treat during it, I, I wanted to just put the, the three studies, the randomized studies that looked at primary prevention of cardiac toxicity. And it's very confusing to look at this data. Um, and you may want to just look at it more carefully later on. I tried to put it in one slide. But the Prada study was with patients who were on epirubicin, and only about 12% had trastuzumab, and, and randomized them in a two-by-two two design to candesartan, placebo, candesartan, metoprolol, or the, the two, or the metoprolol, placebo, or, or just placebo. And the, the bottom line was it looked like there may be some benefit with the ARB, the candesartan, but um, it, it really was minimal. It wasn't a very strongly positive study. And the Manicor study was with patients who were on trastuzumab, and they were randomized to an ACE inhibitor, uh, beta blocker, or placebo. Um, and this study, even though it was said to be positive, you can see on the, the right side, the changes, which are very minimal, minus one, minus three, minus five percent, are all within really the limits of error, even though it has a significant p-value. And then finally, the most recent study that was just presented and not published yet at the American College of Cardiology looked at carvedilol in versus placebo, and this is the, the strongest study of the three comparing those two in patients who are on doxorubicin, and there was absolutely no difference or benefit, at least this is in the preventative setting. So this is the data that we have. You can see how small the ends are. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's clear that there's no benefit. I think that probably you know bigger studies need to be done to really rule out some benefit in, in these patients. And just to um, make one last comment, when you, you know when we see these patients, we frequently see these drops in ejection fraction. Can we continue treatment? And Dr. Ewer many years ago presented um, this nice study where patients who were on trastuzumab and had a drop in ejection fraction in the second box, um, then following standard therapy for heart failure, their ejection fraction came up, and then following trastuzumab, it didn't drop again, showing really in this group of patients, though I, it wasn't a prospective study, clearly that they could continue treating with a life-saving therapy with trastuzumab. So we decided to do at Georgetown with Dr. Anna Brock, who's a, a great young cardiologist, and Philippa Lentz, um, oncologist, 
a pilot study called the Safe Heart Study to see if we could continue treatment even though a patient's ejection fraction was low. And these um, patients had an ejection fraction of 40 to 49 percent, were treated very, um, very aggressively with cardiac medications, and we just presented at ASCO our results showing in the 30 patients that 27 of the patients did fine, had no events, no cardiac events. We had three that had some problems, one an asymptomatic decline below the normal or the level that we allowed on the study, and then two that had heart failure symptoms that had to be taken off study. But overall, it was really great to see, and we very carefully did this prospectively, that you can really continue treatment with this life-saving um, HER2-targeted therapy in these patients who have a lower ejection fraction. So to summarize, what do we do now with all of this information? And as I mentioned, a lot of it is not evidence-based. Um, you can't randomize everything. I think my recommendations would that you would try to get a 3D echo if possible, if not 2D is okay, and follow up um, based on the specific treatment you're giving. For anthracyclines, I would say it would be baseline and after treatment, um, if it's less than 240 per meter squared, which is what we should be using for trastuzumab baseline and every three months, but as I've mentioned a couple of times, practically speaking, I think that's really difficult to do every three months and really not necessary to do every three months. So consider stopping surveillance altogether if they're doing well, and I think that's how what Dr. Ewer thinks, or decrease it to once every six to 12 months. There's clearly right now no evidence of, of good benefit from any of these um, cardiac drugs as I showed you in that that one slide though not ruled out I, w I wouldn't say they the studies were large enough to rule it out um, really no routine measurement of troponins or BNP are recommended right now by any of the guidelines and then I really think there's a lot of potential for these global strain measurements to predict cardiac dysfunction, but they're currently not in the mainstream for determining cardiac treatment until we get probably results of, from the SUCR study that I mentioned, and many other um, cardiologists are certainly looking at the strain measurements. So the other aspect of this whole field of cardio-oncology, I think, is that we're working more closely with our cardiologists. I think it's incredibly helpful. I've been doing this a long time, and we originally have been interested in cardiac events a long time and didn't really have a lot of colleagues interested in it. But now it's very exciting that this has really become a field, and I think our patients will be doing better, we'll have better outcomes, we'll have earlier detection, hopefully prevent further cardiac damage, and really eliminate any cardiac disease as a barrier for our treatment. And I just love the ability to work with our colleagues in cardiology in, in this whole area. And I'd specifically like to thank Dr. Ewer, who has really been my mentor in this area and really has led the field of cardio-oncology. And, and for those of you who don't know, he's also a pilot, so he took me up for a ride in his plane at the San Antonio meeting this year. So thank you, Dr. Ewer, and thank you all for your attention.